a warm good morning to all of you. On behalf of Sun Pharma, I wish to extend my sincere thanks to all of you for joining us this morning. A heartfelt thanks to all our beautiful families who are sharing you with us on this Tuesday morning. We salute to all frontline warriors, the doctors, and very especially ENT specialists of India and from the globe. Let us begin our series 10 of uh, IASSA classroom today. And it gives me immense pleasure to invite Dr. Mekli from uh, Australia, Dr. Vikas Agarwal from Mumbai, Dr. Vidya Sagar from uh, Vijaywala, and our own Dr. Srinivas Kishore, who is also going to be our moderator for the day. I hope all of you are finding these sessions very, very informative and useful. With this, may I hand over the session to Dr. Srinivas Kishore. Hello, everyone. Good morning and good afternoon. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the uh, Series 10 of IASSA Classroom the unique initiative by uh, the Indian Association of Surgeons for Sleep Apnea and Sun Pharma. At the outset, would like to extend uh, my sincere thanks to Sun Pharma for uh, making this happen. Um, so today we have uh, a, a very unique uh, 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 talks by uh, a dear friend Stuart Mackay. Uh, our Vikas Agarwal and uh, a talk on epiglottis by Vidya Sagar. Stuart, I've known him for about 10 years now. He's a giant in the field of uh, obstructive sleep apnea. He's been doing amazing work. Uh, he's very good in, uh, in research and he's published a lot of techniques. He has his own uh, 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 UPP techniques and tongue based techniques. The topic he's uh, discussing today is uh, like uh, tips and tricks on tongue base. Um, without further ado, Stuart, take it away. Okay, okay. can everyone hear me okay? Yes, loud yeah. and clear. Yeah, look, thanks very much for the invitation, Srinivas. So it's a uh, it's a great honor. I think I was um, actually involved in the first um, ever IASACON meeting yes. that you guys had in Chennai back in 2013. And so yes. it's, it's good to see you guys running this webinar as well. And so, um, yeah, I was going to talk on some tips and we just sort of labeled them one to 10 on treating the tongue for the sleep surgeon. Um, they're they're going to be delivered in no particular order and certainly not necessarily in treatment prescription order. It's just a few things that I've learned and picked up along the way. And many of them are basic and possibly a little too basic for sophisticated sleep surgical audiences, but perhaps some horizontal stuff thrown in there as well. So I uh, hope you enjoy and get something out of it. Um, we had Tom Hanks in Australia. He, um, you know, talking of coronavirus, he got coronavirus and was isolated in a Gold Coast hospital when he was here and someone paid a joke on him giving him uh, Wilson from his uh, Castaway movie from when he was isolated. But we've been pretty fortunate in Australia with tight regulations. Uh, less than 0.7% or around 7,000 of the 1 million plus people that have been tested have been positive. And our total deaths have remained under 100 patients. So we're, we've done pretty well with tight restrictions and we're slowly returning to elective operating at about 25% capacity now in the last two weeks and starting to ramp up. Uh, so I feel for those countries that have been harder hit, but it's uh, great to join everyone on this webinar. Um, so we'll get into it. Tip number one. Uh, Srinivas, you can still hear me okay? Yes, sir. I can hear you. Perfect, good. So tip number one relates essentially to the clinical assessment component of management. Uh, by that I mean management should include assessment and investigation and treatment. And one caveat is when you're undertaking your clinical assessment, you will make some errors if you're trying to isolate different levels during the assessment phase. And yes, we all do it. We move the tip of the nasal endoscope to different positions during either our awake or our sleep dynamic assessment. But sometimes you might find a single unifying collapse driver uh, that's responsible for multi-level collapse. So 
I think the message here is just be wary um, about isolating single levels like retrolingual collapse. Uh, so during your clinical assessment first, carefully look for any generators and contributors collapse, even try and seek out that nice but rare scenario in which you've got lower pole of large tonsil that's generating the retrolingual segment collapse in addition to its already contributory collapse at the oropharyngeal driven area. So that's the first tip, be aware not to try and isolate and think, okay, tongue alone, think of the whole airway when you're doing your assessment. Tip number two, this relates to general surgical considerations when you're treating the tongue. So, and I think you need to just carefully weigh up the options for surgically managing the tongue and simplify them as best as you possibly can, even when the anatomy is complicated. In other words, keep it simple. If the tongue is large, try and reduce it and consider how you might do that. If there's lingual tonsil hypertrophy, reduce it. Uh, less commonly now, uh, with the advent of um, hypoglossal nerve stimulation, uh, particularly in clinical trials in my country, hypotonia or a redundant tongue won't get tongue tensing surgery anymore. So it's been many years since I last did a geniotubercle advancement. And um, further to that, uncommonly, but in a reasonable amount of times, I'll stabilise an epiglottis with a plasteal pexy type surgery. And I think one of the other speakers on this program is going to cover that area. So consider the options that you've got when we're treating the tongue. And as I say, the re reduction of macroglossia is the, uh, is the most common in my hands. And I like to consider it as a spectrum of options from um, one end, the more limited interventions to the other end, the more significant interventions. So both with the complications associated with larger surgery, as in submucosal lingoplasty described by Robinson, and with the advent of hypoglossal nerve stimulation, it's now becoming increasingly rare for me to progress beyond these first two options that I've listed here uh, for, the, for tongue reduction surgeries. Uh, with radiofrequency or radiofrequency in saline, as in coblation, representing a very limited and low risk intervention available to execute simultaneously with more definitive palatal type surgeries without the addition of much potential complication. And uh, Coblamo, or this coblation assisted Lewis and Mackay operation that we, we named, a submucosal type of midline glossectomy component that we borrowed from Robinson's submucosal lingoplasty and combined it with lateral radio frequency channels uh, to give a more aggressive tongue reduction than number one, but still limiting the risk to the lateral neurovascular structures that's associated with number three here. And for those of you that are interested uh, and, and not familiar uh, in reading more about those options, I've just listed three main references here. The, um, the top one relates to number one, the middle one relates to number two, and the bottom one relates to number three. And they're, they're essentially descriptors of technique um, with a little bit of uh, outcome measures and evidence to go with it. So tip number three, I'm, I'm calling this tip three plus. Uh, or three hashtag or three A to J or whatever, if you like, because it sort of follows on from tip number two on tongue reduction surgery, uh, if you like. These, throughout the next couple of slides, I'm just running through some do's and don'ts when you actually are reducing the tongue. So, because um, we don't have the time to go into detail of uh, and the exactitudes of technique, I just want to give you these pits, tips and pitfalls that I've learnt to try right. and follow no matter which technique you're using to reduce the tongue size. So they are as follows. Do carefully plan the extent of the reduction that's required and use your combination of clinical, polysomnographic, nasendoscopic, and sometimes imaging findings. I sometimes still use CT airway reconstruction protocols for measuring the tongue or even rarely MRI. Don't transgress the anterior uh, two and a half to three centimetres of the tongue. This is the portion of the tongue where the neurovascular bundle starts to medialise close to the midline and you start to run into more risk if you're treating that area. If you're going to reduce some tongue, it's acceptable to come right down to the midline raphae quarterly 
And post rotocordially, that is, the further back you go, you'll often see a small cuff of genioglossus muscle. And it's okay to increase the bulk of your reduction submucosally when you've got that tongue open to actually resect a small cuff of that genioglossus muscle. It does not affect function when you just take that curved cuff that's coming up beyond the midline raffi. Uh, don't buy polar obvious arterial vasculature. It's better to ligger or liger clip those or put a tie on them uh, because they're the things that with shear force as the tongue starts to move will cause you troubles. Whereas venous um, bleeders in the tongue, you can very safely bipolar um, or stop with cautery. And I think this is an important one in my hands and it's, there's some debate around this. You'll hear others, especially robotic advocates that don't necessarily do this, but I think it's important to preserve and respect the mucosa and do as much as you can submucosally and then put things back together over the top. One of the main reasons for that is patients will complain about sensory changes. So it's not taste, it's, it's more a sensory dysfunction that they complain about when you disrupt the mucosa, whereas if you keep that intact and put it back together, they're less likely to complain about that. The next lot of um, tips and pitfalls as a part of three here is, I think don't do your more aggressive spectrum tongue reduction without either having intraoperative ultrasound on hand to identify the main lingual arteries or carefully dissecting out until you see the lingual arteries. I know Richard Lewis, many of you are aware, my colleague from Perth actually, when he goes posteriorly, does a mushroom type submucosal lingoplasty where he goes out laterally and carefully looks for the lingual arteries in the same way as you try and track the facial nerve in a parotid operation. Uh, as I mentioned before, along the lines of um, respecting the mucosa, do try and clo close both the muscle and the mucosa over the top, but it's completely acceptable to leave a small drainage hole posteriorly in the mucosa if you've done a midline glossectomy through the middle third of the tongue. Don't extubate the patient immediately if there's significant risk or you've done a very major resection. I'm talking about 12, 13, 14 um, uh, millilitres of tongue resection. I start to be cautious about an immediate um, extubation, especially if I've combined it with fairly major palatal surgery. Um, I am relaxing that uh, that rule somewhat in terms of the timing. I used to sometimes leave people intubated overnight, but oftentimes I'll just delay their extubation by two to four hours and wait until the anaesthetist has got them back to high dependency, go around there with the anaesthetist at that time and extubate the patient while they're very awake and almost biting on the tube and you've given them plenty of steroid to reduce swelling. Um, do use Presidex or dexmedetomidine if you've got it available at your hospitals because it's very easy to manipulate the mean arterial blood pressure by use of that medication. And at the completion of your surgery before you close up, you can, if you're doing a, a, anything bigger than a midline glossectomy, drive the mean arterial pressure up over 110 millimetres of mercury and check all your bleeders, control them all, and very, very rarely I still use a drain if I'm doing a really extensive submucosal lingoplasty. But uh, the goal once you've then completed the operation is to try and have the mean arterial pressure never go above 100 millimetres of mercury. If you've checked them at 110 millimetres and on the ward you keep them at 100 millimetres of mercury as a mean arterial pressure and you can measure that with frequent one to two hourly measurements whilst awake and get the nursing staff to contact you if you get close to that range, then you're less likely to run into significant hematoma or bleeding into the tongue in the 24 to 48 hours after surgery. And I, I, I recognise this is open to some debate as well. I don't do simultaneous lingual tonsil reduction and major tongue resection. And this relates to my earlier point about preserving mucosa. If you're going to do a reasonable extra mucosal operation like lingual tonsil reduction, then possibly just some radio frequency of the tongue and come back another day and do a second stage, bigger tongue reduction if it's going to be required. Sometimes you'll get away without the need to do that anyway from what you've already done. So those are my, uh, I guess, my tips, 10 or 12 tips that relate to actual tongue reduction surgery. So going on to tip number four, and, and this tip is that when you're accessing the extra mucosal aspects of the posterior third of the tongue, such as lingual tonsil or the epiglottis, 
then my advice is, um, although I don't deride the use of a microscope or a robot, it can be done just as well with a carefully placed uh, Lindholm microscope, a laryngoscope and use of zero and 30 degree scopes with an assistant or with your loop magnification. And then all you need to do instead of using the microscope is just periodically and gently reposition the laryngoscope throughout the procedure to access various different positions, say for example, in the follicular. Um, in addition to that, when you are reducing lingual tonsil tissue, whether it be using a manipulated or molded, molded suction diathermy or coblator or other device, you can get, as you can see in this picture here, fairly genuine lingual tonsil reduction and the pressure that it had created secondarily on the epiglottis, you can reduce that significantly without necessarily uh, vaporizing every single bauble of lingual tonsil. So uh, I recognize that that might leave some residual risk of regrowth, but it probably reduces the risk of cicatrization and in particular a chronic sensory deficit or globus sensation that some patients will complain about when they can feel the scar in the back of their throat long term, which is a little more likely the more aggressive the reduction that you do. So I'm, I'm preaching a little bit of conservatism there in terms of your lingual tonsil reduction. Uh, tip number five, and this one relates to surgery that I don't do. Um, Srinivas and others might want to comment on what actually happens in India, but um, I don't perform my own maxillomandibular advancement uh, surgery. I refer on given the complexities of um, uh, orthodontics and bite and occlusion, but rest assured it's an intervention that has a, a powerful treatment effect on the polysomnographic parameters of the disease that we treat. Um, the key, I think, is informing patients about two important impacts. And I try to word the patients on up on this before I even send them to the maxillofacial surgeon for the opinion so that they're thinking about it ahead of time. And that is number one, numbness, which in my experience in following these patients up after I've referred them on is quite common as a consequence of the intervention and sometimes is common long-term. And two, the change in the facial profile and appearance that the patient gets the patient will notice this and, and they need to be psychologically ready for the alterations. It's not a minor undertaking. They will look in the mirror and see a, a different person. So they need to be prepared for that, um, I think, before they even consider undergoing what is a fairly involved intervention. Uh, tip number six. So we're about halfway through now. I don't know if I, I'll rushing too much there, Srinivas, but gives us more time for questions if I am. Um, this one relates to nerve stimulation therapy. Um, my experience with uh, implantation has been the Genio Nixoa device, and it's depicted here, and I've got a couple of references. This, this one up the top is a reference with the main outcomes paper, and this one down here is a reference for the main description of the technique of implantation. Um, it's an implantable bilateral stimulator with the antenna here that hugs the genioglossal muscle, muscles um, in the midline and the electrodes on each side are, um, are sutured uh, so the paddles connect directly to the hypoglossal nerves. Um, and the external stimulator, which is this thing here, which is stuck on at night, is worn and is set off a duty cycle from repeated polysomnograms to get things like delay and amplitude and intensity right for patient comfort and for disease improvement and control. So my tip that relates to this, I'd like to just run a video and uh, Srinivas just jump in and tell me, I think it should work. The, um, the technician just told me before I run it to um, go in and just optimize share a full screen so hopefully it doesn't pause on you as we go we'll see how we go here this video illustrates hypoglossal nerve dissection for implantation of the genio nixoa mini hypoglossal nerve stimulator a bilateral stimulating device and you can see here a bipolar stimulating probe is placed on the proximal end of the hypoglossal nerve on the right hand side to stimulate it the probe is actually now pointing to the right genioglossus muscle which is gently picked up with forceps and retracted medially 
to place the hypoglossal nerve under some traction. And again, stimulation of the nerve proximally and the brisk activity of the genioglossus and hyoglossus are noted. And more distally, the greater contraction of the genioglossus muscle with minimal hyoglossus activity. And then one can identify the branch to the hyoglossus coming off the hypoglossal nerve and stimulate it. And you can see there the brisk contraction of the hyoglossus muscle noted. Also note the stimulating electrode with the red marker around the white probe inserted into the hyoglossus muscle. Note the different activity in the different muscles with varying positions of stimulation of the hypoglossal nerve and the branch to the hyoglossus muscle. A pocket can be created beyond the nerve to the hyoglossus, but before the hypoglossal nerve enters the genioglossus muscle. And this is the ideal position for placement of the electrode of the right half of the genionixel device. You can see a neuropathy being inserted into the pocket, which will subsequently be widened, widened and developed further for introduction of the right part of the device. So I think the key, uh, key yeah. point that I was keen to um, amplify on there is we now know better and better from nerve stimulation that if we can exclude the nerve branch to retrusor muscles like the hyoglossus, we get much better stimulation of the dilator muscles only. So I think we're getting better and better in implantation. Uh, but I also think we're getting better at titration. And I just share this video, which is hot off the press because this was a drug-induced sleep endoscopy that I performed this morning, only a couple of hours ago, on a patient who we implanted about six weeks ago. And he's been slowly titrated um, up to an amplitude of 5% and 50 milliseconds that he's been using early on at home. And you can see when I run the video, how much collapse there still is at that level. This is a drug-induced sleep endoscopy and you see device off, and now device on flicks it forward, off and on. You can see we've still got a fair bit of collapse of the airway, but using the, the gradually incrementally increasing the amplitude of the Nixola device up to 25% and extending the um, pulse duration, you can see much better treatment effect and much wider open airways. So you can see they're on and then off as it relaxes back and on again. You can see the stimulation of the device and how much it's opening up that tongue segment and epiglottic segment. So um, I think the, the, the summary here, the tip here is that once you get involved in nerve stimulation, once it becomes available, and I guess you guys can comment on the availability in India at the moment, that you'll get better and better at implantation that you'll get better and better at using dynamic assessment, awake and drug-induced sleep assessment to titrate the device appropriately. And I guess for now, even though drug-induced sleep endoscopy is certainly not everything and I don't use it all the time, this one this morning was suggestive that we should be aiming to get this particular patient towards 25% amplitude and around 90 milliseconds as a pulse duration as a pretty reasonable goal. So tip number seven, that brings us to. Um, and I think this one relates um, to tongue fat and its role in obstructive sleep apnea. And in the setting of Rick Schwab's and then, then Kim and Schwab's work that I've referenced here just over five years ago, uh, there was identification of the fact that similar body mass indices, as in this patient, for example, this is a postmenopausal female, uh, two postmenopausal females who are similarly matched to body mass index, um, that uh, the patient with greater sleep apnea was the one who had greater tongue volume and greater tongue fat within that volume. And so perhaps there's some sort of role here for treating that tongue fat. And I am aware that it, throughout the world, particularly uh, in Pittsburgh and a couple of other places, there are some trials currently underway that are investigating cryotype 
surgical therapies to the tongue fat to reduce that on the basis of such, such pathology. I guess the other question is, could weight loss um, be a treatment for, for tongue fat? Um, the problem with it is, uh, number one is, as you just saw, having a lower BMI doesn't necessarily imply that you will reduce tongue fat. And the second issue, of course, is sustainability and follow through. It's often not tenable to have patients to maintain weight loss and future weight gain can potentially lead to recrudescent disease. But that's just a little digression away from airway surgery to think about, is there something we could do as surgeons about tongue fat and tongue volume other than our traditional tongue operations? And tip number eight, I suppose, is a, is a digression again away from surgery. Um, and in publications that we've seen from endophenotypers, and many of you uh, on this um, webinar will recall Atul Maholtra speaking at our meeting in 2017 in California, the IS meeting, it was suggested in some of these publications that we should seek out traits that might permit combining existing therapies to other existing therapies or combining um, existing therapies to experimental and horizontal treatments. Um, and I think that's an important uh, concept. Although much of that is not in routine practice, our future paradigms might need us to incorporate a more detailed history and examination with dynamic airway assessment and derive more from the sleep study than just a surrogate marker of disease, the apnea hypopnea index, and perhaps try to integrate some of these traits with endotyping, the upper airway collapsibility traits, the hyporesponsivity, the reduced arousal threshold type sleep apnea, and the loop gain type into our decision making. Uh, and in some ways that might result in more targeted tongue therapy, for example, seeking out the patients who dominantly have this physiological trait and uptaking them for hypoglossal nerve stimulation earlier on in the piece where reduced dilator activity is deemed their main contributor to their disease. Or combination therapies across these different types because um, we know that, uh, uh, that, as in this slide, the top corner demonstrates the clinical heterogeneity of obstructive sleep apnea. The middle slide uh, was this attempt by the endophenotypers to classify things out clearly into four different subgroups. But the bottom corner, I think, is the reality of the disease that we treat, that adult obstructive sleep apnea is representative of heterogeneity. These phenotypes or endotypes aren't as clean as you might hope, but the reality of complexity and overlap uh, is what we're representing here down the bottom corner. So I think, um, I think this, at a physiological level, also interlinks back to my earlier point about anatomically isolating the tongue without an appropriate consideration of multi-level collapse in the whole airway. So anatomically and physiologically, there's heterogeneity, and that requires our consideration when we're considering different treatments, including tongue therapies. Uh, tip number nine, on the theme of combination therapy, uh, I'm just gonna talk a little bit now about um, uh, how we might treat the patient surgically and for example, with mandibular advance and splints. So trying to combine, in a sense, two existing therapies. Um, uh, the theory was first championed over 20 years ago by this uh, group in Rhode Island, uh, which makes the limited number of publications on surgery and mandibular advance and splint all the more uh, surprising, but here it is. The simplified explanation or cause of a poor responder after uh, U3P surgery, whether it be traditional or uh, more contemporary U3P type surgery, is either there's retrolingual collapse that we haven't treated, or as Woodson and others have indicated, there's technical failure at the retroplatal segment, or as I talked about with the global airway, there's uh, ongoing collapse at both. And the theory of combining palatal surgery with a mandibular advancing splint to treat the next level, so to speak, is that mandibular advance and splints can shorten this distance from the hyoid to the mid uh, mandibular plane height and thereby open up the posterior airway space. The concept for those that are work closely with dentists and orthodontists is, um, is what's been shown in distraction osteogenesis papers, that distraction osteogenesis can reduce this vertical height by up to five to six millimetres and such a reduction actually correlates 
with a consequent four to five millimeter improvement in the posterior airway space in the retrolingual segment specifically. Uh, and perhaps to modernize the theory 20 years down the track, um, also potentially open up the retropalatal airway if there is some form of coupling conceivably by virtue of attachments of palatoglossus fibers or superior constrictor fibers or both. So keep that in consideration, but I feel one thing you have to be aware about in combination surgery and jaw splint, it is likely to go over better in patients who are already wearing a jaw splint and not getting as much treatment effect out of it if you then say, let's add some platal surgery to it and then go back to wearing a mouth guard. Or we've already had an upfront planning discussion and the patient is aware that it's not inconceivable the complications of both and even the possible exacerbation of side effects of one by the other um, uh, by impl impl implementation of one of the two techniques first. One, one area I could potentially see getting worse is hypersalivation with both treatments, but we just don't know that because we haven't got enough research to tell us whether the complications are worse if you combine surgery with the mandibular advance and splint. Uh, and that brings me on to tip number 10. Um, so the last tip here, I think, is to have a checklist. Um, I'm not sure if uh, Robson Capasso or, or Pete uh, were invited to this uh, um, webinar, but um, it's a great checklist. It's very, very involved. And so it's quite difficult, I think, for people starting out to, to spend a lot of time covering off on all these issues. But I've noticed over the last decade, my own tendency to operate less and less, the more that I find or seek out some of these features. Uh, one example um, here under hormonal imbalances is the gym junkie uh, on anabolic steroid or testosterone, because it seems the extremes of usage of uh, anabolic steroid or testosterone or over or even under replacement of testosterone in men gives them a form of sleep apnea that for whatever hormonal imbalance reason is very hard to treat with salvage options other than CPAP. So surgery doesn't seem to have as big an effect. Uh, second no-no seems to be, for me, untreated insomnia or anxiety or distorted sleep. So I try and have that corrected first if there's comorbid sleep apnea before I engage the thought of salvage surgery for the comorbid sleep apnea side of things. So, um, the last few points there, not specifically related to surgery, but in your decision making, your thinking related to surgery, I think they're very important. And uh, Srinivas, if I can indulge, uh, more importantly is tip number 11. Uh, we've, rescheduled, we've rescheduled the uh, IWS meeting that was to be held in October, and it's now going to be held in Wollongong in my backyard in late January. I'm hoping that many of you can commit to travel to come to the meeting. Uh, and I'm engaging some airline, such as airlines such as Qantas and local accommodation so that you'd be able to book up front and still get a, a refund if we decide just before Christmas that we that travel still restricted and we have to have a hybrid online meeting as a contingency. So please keep an eye out and go to the IWS website and Surgical Sleep 2020, which is now Surgical Sleep 2021 to keep updated. Thanks for having me Srinivas and uh, VJ. it's a great pleasure. Thank you, uh, Stuart. Uh, if you can stop sharing your screen so we can have you uh, on video. That's a great talk, uh, uh, Stuart. It was brilliant. Um, so I think, uh, so uh, how are we doing this, guys? Are we doing the questions now? Yes. <laughs> yeah. If, so if, if Vickers and the other two speaker have got time for me to deal with a few now, That'd be great if you're happy. Yeah, because, because absolutely uh, fine. so as you know, uh, ours is an international platform. So uh, we have questions coming from all over the world, uh, Stuart. Yep. So the first question is from uh, Eva. You you know Eva from Poland? Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, her question is, what would you advise to do? with the patient who keeps complaining of kind of global sensation in the base tongue, which has been bothering her for more than a year already after tongue-based surgery with cublation? I think the answer is run. <laughs> no. uh, yeah, it's, it's a complicated um, thing, Eva. And that's why I hope, I just hope out of a couple of things that I said there, you might 
maybe just be able to pick that patient before you dive into an operation on them and, and try to avoid surgery on that patient. It's not always easy. And I've had a, a, just a sprinkling of them myself. And the bad news is oftentimes if they get up to that point in time, you really are in a scenario where they're probably going to have the symptom long term. And so you really are down to everything you possibly can outside of surgical interventions to try and improve that scenario. Anti-reflux treatments, subtle alkalinized water, vocal hygiene, engaging a speech therapist who is key, I think, and explaining to the patient it's not, the speech therapist is not for voice therapy, it's for physiotherapy for your throat. Um, and I have been lucky enough to have some improvement in a handful of patients in that group. I, I specifically remember one chap who only had very limited tongue intervention, a bit of lingual tonsil reduction, I think, and a bit of radio frequency. who had the same complaints four months, six months later, delayed his post-operative sleep study. But when I got the post-operative sleep study result back, he was so obsessed with the numbers and so pleased that the numbers had improved that the globus sensation tended to fade as well. So you will have a handful of those patients who focus obsessively on things who have to feel that they're gonna get the value out of the intervention before they can let go some mild residual symptom. I also try and give careful reassurance and explain things to them in detail and even so it's a lot of hand holding as well as the speech therapy input. You know, I try and explain to patients, it's not unlike appendicectomy scars. I, I had my appendix out when I was 20 and still from time to time, you feel a little twinge in the scar line or deep to the scar line. It's not gonna be nothing forever, um, but you can de-emphasize and defocus and desensitize those, those hypersensitive cells, I guess, is what I try and tell the patients. So I, I, hope that, I hope that helps, but there's not really a conquerable answer to it. Right, so I, uh, I don't know what she was referencing to. Is it, is it uh, lingual tonsils or is it, is it classical midline or really the, don't the know other, that too because they're two different the things of phenotypes. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And, and I would say for lingual tonsil, try not to create cicatrizing scar or really broad scar because you might get a tendency to complain about that a little more, especially the more lateral it goes. And with um, tongue reductions, try to preserve some mucosa. That's where... The only debate that I have with the, the robotic um, enthusiasts is preserving some of that mucosa because it's the sensation that the patient complains about and it's kind of like a, a sensory globus in a way. So just be wary of that preemptively. Uh, the next question is from uh, uh, Professor Bic Gotecha from London. Um, Hi, Bic. So he says, uh, he has a couple of questions actually. So he says, uh, do you perform minimally invasive radiofrequency therapy for tongue base under local anesthesia? I don't do it under local BIC. I do it in um, the operating theatre. A couple of reasons for that is one is I've got pretty easy access to theatre. It's not um, in some countries where it's fairly restricted, I suppose, going to the operating theatre. Um, uh, it's rare for me to perform that in isolation, I know you, you you talk about that and you've done so so well at IS meetings, Vic, about that. I guess in my hands, it's rare to get a really potent treatment effect out of radio frequency alone, uh, except to multiple le levels of the airway. So maybe if I was gonna do it, I might try and at least put some radio frequency in the turbinates, palate, tongue, rather than just one isolated area. If I am doing one isolated area, I have tended to find, and, and Vic himself, as the expert in, in these minimally invasive areas, might want to comment for us, but um, I have tended to find that $20 worth of sodium tetra, uh, you know, sodium uh, tetra yeah, sulfate can achieve just a similar effect as $1,800 worth of pillar implants or stiffening procedures. So in my hands, I'm tending to see a greater population of um, sleep apnea unable to wear device devices right. rather than focus on simple snoring but um yeah i hope that answers the question but it, i think if there's anyone on who doesn't know vic you should certainly take his advice and input into minimally invasive treatments for snoring well, i think he changed his sort of champions that cause the uh the second question is a sort of extension to the first one and he says uh in one of his patients who underwent um RF ablation of the uh, tongue base with a bipolar radio frequency. He's developed an infection and submental swelling of a previously underdiagnosed pyroglossal tract cyst. Yeah, wow. And this was confirmed with scans and 
She says, yeah. uh, have you had uh, such complications? I, I, I haven't. Um, I have actually had one patient who was referred to me by, by a close colleague who, with obstructive sleep apnea who had an undiagnosed dumbbelling thyroglossal duct cyst. I've got a good picture of it that I keep off some imaging. And, and when that was ultimately dealt with, it actually almost completely resolved their obstructive sleep apnea. So, uh, and that harks back to, I think, uh, the original, um, Scher's original meta-analysis meta in 1996, where they mentioned about one in 100 to 200 patients actually have demonstrable pathology in the airway as a major contributing factor to their obstructive sleep apnea. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so kind of the opposite in that regard. I haven't been unlucky enough to run into that problem, Dick, and I wonder whether surgical treatment of the thyroglossal duct tract would actually hopefully resolve some of it rather than exacerbate it. But, uh, yeah, good luck. Good luck. <laughs> All right. Um, so a couple of more questions. Um, so the first one, uh, again, is, uh, yeah, so when you talked about tip number one, wherein you emphasize the role for clinical evaluation uh, about, and when you're talking about different levels of uh, obstruction, palatal, lateral pharyngeal yeah. wall. And so yes. what do you think is the role of interventional dice to yep. sort of, uh, what's your take on that? Uh, interventional dice or just mm -hmm. dice? The interventional so in, dice, so because- Interventional dice, I generally consider things like, I usually I would, Think that terminology would refer to doing CPAP at the time of dice or or jaw splint or jaw thrust sure. at the time of yeah. dice. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So I, I should explain uh, for those that are unfamiliar, I put a lot of uh, investment, a lot of time, a lot of energy and a lot of stock in the awake dynamic assessment in trying to get that right because I think we can derive a lot more from it than what we've um, in a way given up on and gone towards drug induced sleep endoscopy. And I tend in adults to use drug induced sleep endoscopy when I've got a specific question. So I'm not so frequently going to theatre for a dice because I want to fill out a form on a vote classification. I'm going there because I've got a question that I couldn't answer on the awake assessment that I need some more help with or some more information with that I can integrate it with. So for example, the Nixoa patient that I showed, for me, the purpose for that dice was to see if we could get an idea of what kind of titration would better open this patient's airway uh, in sleep. Now, we might be overestimating that. So DICE may well overestimate sleep. And there's plenty of um, uh, literature to say that that's the case out of Peter Eastwood's and other groups. But I think it gives a target and it gives me an aim and what I'm looking for. So if I'm going to the operating theatre for someone who's having trouble with a jaw splint because I can't see why, then sure, I'll put a lot of stock in interventional dice at that time and, and putting them in different positions and thrusting their jaw out and popping their jaw spin in and out and seeing what level it can potentially get to. So um, that's the, the short answer. Um, the long answer is it's a lot more involved than that. And really, whatever your dynamic assessment, whether it's awake or asleep or both, just try first to think about the generators of the collapse rather than separating all those segments out. That's that, that I think is the key message. If you can find what's contributing to the collapse, you've got much better means of targeting that treatment or saying to the patient, I can't target that area, which in my hands is the kind of lower airway, global concentric type collapse and collapses in the lower lateral wars, um, which I think is a lot harder to fix without um, horizontal treatments and putting them into clinical trials. The next question is in your hands, uh so if, you're, if I was to ask you uh, uh, a one-line answer as to it, Koblemo or Nixua? <laughs> you know I never have a one-line answer to anything. Come on. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, a yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the answer is it depends. But I'm leaning a lot more towards uh, nerve simulation involvement now. And I don't wanna, I'm, not a zeal, I'm not a nerve simulation zealot. I certainly never have been but i'm leaning a little more that way because it restricts some of the complications of intraoral uh, surgery to the tongue um but it, there's a huge patient preference that comes into it so there's not only our dynamic assessment our clinical examination polysomnographic and uh, imaging there's a huge patient preference component that comes into this so the majority of patients that I'll be talking about midline glossectomy and radiofrequency of the tongue, I'll also be talking about nerve stimulation. 
and I'll be giving them my opinion about the pros and cons of each and, and how far I think I can get them with one or the other um, and then letting them make have an input to the decision. And you'll find that patients have got really uh, strong ideas about what treatments that they like. It doesn't mean we have to follow straight into what the patient wants. It does mean though we have to take it into consideration. So the next question, I think the last one that we have uh, is uh, uh, Vijay's question to you is, in the, in the times of Nixua and Inspire, what is the role of myofunctional therapy? Oh, what a great finish. I hope you'll be at IS 2020, now rescheduled to January 2021 in Wollongong. You know we debate, all will be there. <laughs> for the debate between the two Eric's on myofunctional therapy, therapy Eric Thula versus Eric Kazarian. So right. I don't want to steal their fun. I don't want to steal their thunder. Um, I think myofunctional therapy, uh, and, and Nathan might want to make some comments as well, my fellow who's on, because we got assigned that topic for review for Andy Goldberg's uh, uh, review into sleep apnea. Um, there's a little bit of evidence that supports its use, but it's extremely involved and the practicalities of utilizing it in practice when you've got to do exercises three, four, five times a day are almost harder than asking a patient to lose five kilograms in weight. So I think it's complicated. At a much simpler level, I think it's reasonable to have speech therapists involved in scenarios like the one that Eva presented before. Um, I think it's easy where Richard Lewis says to his patients to do exercises post-operatively to recover from major tongue surgery. He gets them to push the tongue out, bite down, bite the tongue between the teeth, run the tongue along the top of the palate, all of those sorts of things. I don't get too much into those sort of things, but I certainly don't begrudge people who do. It gives the patients a goal and, a, and an objective to focus on rather than focusing on the misery and pain that we put them through for recovery anyway. So, um, but yeah, please don't miss the debate, VJ. Eric versus <laughs> Eric, yeah. January, 2021. Sure. It's in the second day's opening plenary. We're still, we're still working the program. It should be out in the next couple of weeks. Sure. So I think uh, we're pretty done, much done with all the questions, uh, Stuart. Uh, you're, you're welcome to uh, stay in, in, the, in the webinar, but... Uh, yeah, I've got to be back in, back. I'll stay for 10 minutes and then I yeah, have to be sure. back by four o'clock in my time. So, sure. Yeah, great. Thanks so, for having me, guys. And if anyone's got any other questions, uh, Vijay's got my WhatsApp details or uh, you can WhatsApp me or email me. Sure, sure. We'll do. Uh, so uh, the second talk is uh, going to be from uh, Dr. Vikas, wherein uh, he's going to talk about uh, uh, his techniques and um, he, Vikas is uh, our own. And uh, please uh, start presenting your presentation, uh, Vikas. Yeah. So uh, first of all, a wonderful talk by Stuart. A lot of tips and tricks. And I believe uh, Stuart's talk was based on uh, the fact that a lot of people across the world are actually doing tongue-based surgeries and uh, whatever problems they're facing, Stuart has given a very nice tips and tricks to, you know, uh, fine tune these skills. My talk is going to be on the basics because uh, I understand that most of our viewers are not routinely performing tongue-based surgery. So it's the because talk. Can yeah. you start, your, uh, start sharing your screen? Yeah. Are you able to see Srinivas? Yes. So, one sec, guys. Putting meeting controls. Okay. So, basically, my talk will be a little basic talk on when and how to perform tongue based surgery for OSA, uh, taking into account the factor that not many people across our country or even across the world are actually performing tongue-based surgery. So this talk is a little basic talk where I'll be discussing on when and how. So we all understand that hypopharynx is the most important cause of failure for therapy for OSA in the last 30, 35 years that the OSA has been defined and been treated with CPAP. So both CPAP as well as surgery. Surgery also came in early 80s. So the hypopharynx has been the most important cause of failure because we have been operating on uh, the 
soft palate, but we have not been operating on the hypopharynx as much as we have been operating on the soft palate. So if you yeah. look at this, this is wonderful. See, when we are switching off the CPAP, the palate is totally falling. Okay, this okay. is the apnea with the without. Now switch on the CPAP. Switch on the CPAP. So you can see that with CPAP air, the soft palate can be thrown open. But when you do the same thing to the base tongue, so you can understand that soft palate is a tube of thin muscular layers so that can be open with the CPAP pressure but base tongue is a large muscle so it cannot be lifted unless you push up a lot of air with a lot of pressure that cannot be thrown open so base tongue is the area which is uh, absolutely important to surgically treat or to pull up in front with a uh, nerve stimulation or something because CPAP is generally ineffective when the base tongue is actually collapsing. So that brings us to the topic of tongue-based surgery, that whether tongue-based treatment, surgery, or whatever is required or not. So first question arises that what makes you decide whether a tongue-based treatment is required in a particular patient or not? So in that case, we typically decide by looking at the Malampatti or the Friedman classification to decide whether tongue-based surgery is required in a particular patient or not. Now, this is a Malampatti 4. But if you look into the sleep endoscopy of this patient, you can make out that the base tongue is not collapsing. It's not causing any collapse. It's not causing any obstruction. So similarly with Friedman, when the tongue position is uh, seen, Friedman 3 or Friedman 4, the tongue is inside the mouth. In Malampati, it's outside the mouth. But in both cases, you cannot see the base of the tongue. So you can only possibly imagine that the base tongue will also be large because the anterior two thirds of the tongue is large, which is not always the case. So therefore, Friedman and Malampati scores are a good indicator, but they're not sufficient. You definitely need to see at the back of the tongue. Generally, we prefer to do drug induced sleep endoscopy to see that whether in this uh, sleeping position, whether the tongue is causing collapse or not. So this is in the clinical examination. This point is most important apart from all the others to decide whether tongue-based surgery is required or not. Now, many a times we feel that if the BMI of the patient is very high, then the tongue base will be at fault. It's not always the case. When the AHI is very high, the tongue base is bound to be involved. It's not always the case. Though BMI and AR, AHI give you some idea, but they are poor predictors about whether a tongue-based surgery will be required or not. So I will show an example. This patient has a BMI of 30.3 and a AHI of around 57. So BMI of 30 and AHI of 67, 57. You can still see that in the sleep endoscopy, it's only the soft palate. If we look into the place where the uh, collapse is happening, that's the soft palate, lower part of the soft palate. So the base tongue you can see here is absolutely normal. It's not contributing. On the other hand, if there's a problem with the lower segment, so this was the upper segment, we divide into nose and palate as the upper segment. So if the problem is in the upper segment, whether the BMI is 40, whether the AHI is 100, it doesn't matter. Base tongue is not really causing the problem. The problem in the base tongue, when the problem is in the lower segment, base tongue or the epiglottis, it's an altogether different ball game. So if this patient, who has a BMI of only 22.3, very less, and an AHI of only 10. Right, the AHI is only 10. So even in this patient, if you see, with the mouth open, the collapse is complete. So I leave his mouth. The base tongue and the down. epiglottis are completely collapsing. Complete so collapse. though generally the, with the large the BMI, High AHIs, you may have tongue-based collapse, but it's not a rule and you must see whether the same thing is happening or not. 
Second point is that every tongue base collapse that you see in the drug induced sleep endoscopy need not be operated. I think Stuart again uh, came up to that point very nicely that uh, you just cannot decide everything on the dice because dice also has its own limitations. So interventional dice was being talked about. So if you see a tongue base which is collapsing what happens when the nose is blocked the mouth remains open when the mouth remains open the mandible goes down when the mandible goes down the hyoid also goes down and when the person is sleeping then when the hyoid is dropping the tongue base is also collapsing so if you look at this example here you see the tongue base collapsing when the patient's mouth is open this is around 67 so in the correct range and the moment you close the mouth see the baseline is not collapsing close with neck extension. right again the moment you let the mouth open the tongue base is collapsing so if the cause of tongue base collapse is in the nose because the mouth is remaining open you do not need to perform tongue base surgery. A very, very simple intervention. You close the mouth of the patient and see whether the tongue base is still collapsing or not can help you prevent a tongue base surgery. Now, in our own classification, uh, the actually not classification, the DICE reporting system, we have defined the base of tongue as upper, lower, entire. Upper is from foramen cecum to the tip of epiglottis. Lower is from tip of epiglottis to the vellicula. Then we have defined the muscular uh, tongue as muscular or lymphoid or both and then the grading. Now why is this important to understand because the upper base tongue poses all together different treatment as from the lower base tongue because the lower base tongue is much easier to treat it's a smaller area to operate as against the upper base tongue. So if you look at this example now this is a huge tongue base collapse after a palatal surgery you can see the palate is not coming in the way at all but it's the upper part of the tongue. So this is the anterior two third of the tongue and you can see the valley, uh, the foramen cecum here and the this is the junction area of the anterior two third and the posterior one third. So a high tongue base collapse, you cannot actually do a midline glossectomy and get away because it will still keep on obstructing. So you'll have to pull this tongue forward or you do some techniques which I'm going to discuss later which will possibly um, you know help. Otherwise the treatment for them is maxillomandibular advancement. On the other hand, if you see a lower tongue base collapse, which is pressing on to the epiglottis, you can see the lymphoid muscular base tongue, lymphoid plus muscular base tongue pressing on to the epiglottis. But you can see that the, here the area in question is small. And here, if you perform a tongue base and epiglottic surgery, you'll get a very good result. In this case, it's the combination. It's both upper and lower. You see the whole tongue, both upper and lower. Whole tongue is collapsing. Now this is a, again a different uh, ball game altogether. So once you decide what kind of a patient you are having, then you decide what surgery is to be done. Lymphoid versus muscular. See lymphoid tongue generally is much easier to treat because it's a submucosal lymphoid tissue. So there is no named vessel which is coming into it. It's not gr grossly vascular. You're not going to get any artery into it. And so lymphoid tissue can be treated like lingual tonsil can be treated like a tonsillectomy. And whereas the muscular based tongue, you'll have all the vessels coming into it. So, but you can still have a large lymphoid tissue like this where surgery is not really difficult because still it is a submucosal tissue. But the intubation and extubation are going to be really, really difficult. So you have to understand that this is pure lymphoid based tongue, which is completely pressing onto the epiglottis versus a purely muscular based tongue. Now here, here you can see there's hardly any lymphoid tissue, but it's all muscular based tongue. So I believe uh, looking at the back of the tongue with a flexible scope is a must. And if you do that during sleep, it's all the more better so that you can, you can get an idea of what you're dealing with a um, lymphoid base tongue, a muscular base tongue, a collapsible base tongue, size is normal. And then you can decide on what treatment is to be done. Then again, we also 
look at the lateral hypopharyngeal wall and larynx, the, especially the epiglottis, primary or secondary collapse. Primary collapse when there's no base tongue, it's only the median glossoepiglottic ligament which is lax and which is causing the epiglottis to collapse. In that case, the treatment is very simple. You just go on to that and coagulate that and the whole epiglottis will retract. Versus, as I showed you earlier, the secondary epiglottic collapse, which is happening because of the lower base. Tongue. So then interventional dice, uh, Srinivas has already talked about closure of mouth and Eschmark maneuvers uh, and then putting a nasopharyngeal airway. So I will just show you this. When you put a nasopharyngeal airway and then put your scope inside the nasopharyngeal airway and then you bypass the nose as the site of obstruction, you bypass the soft palate also as the site of obstruction. And then if you see the base of the tongue and the epiglot is collapsing, then you decide that treatment is required. If only by putting it, you see that the base tongue and the epiglottis is not collapsing, then possibly you do not need to operate on the base tongue and the epiglottis. So by these measures, the number of surgeries that you perform on base tongue and the epiglottis can be minimized because they were unnecessarily uh, getting operated. So then some positional variation like uh, Dr. Nico has uh, done a lot of research on to uh, uh, positional dye, positional sleep apnea. So we also rotate the head and see. If it is a collapsible tongue, then obviously the now the uh, era is coming of hyponoglossal nerve stimulation. And though we do not have it in Asia as of now, we expect that in the next coming four or five years, hopefully we'll get this in our country, in our region. And for the collapsible tongue, this is going to be the treatment of choice. Important thing to understand is that when we are operating the tongue, it's not the anterior two third of the tongue, it's the base of the tongue. And the base of the tongue starts from foramen cecum onwards. It is not ahead of the foramen cecum, it is behind foramen cecum. And it's the base of the tongue which actually collapses onto the airway. So you almost always never need to operate anterior two third of the tongue unless you have some really gross macroglossia where you might have to come into a part of the anterior two-third, but by and large, it is the base of the tongue, not the anterior two-third of the tongue that is required. Therefore, you can see the cross put onto the anterior two-third of the tongue. And in the base of the tongue, luckily there are no important muscles. Extrinsic muscles are not there. There are no important vessels. So if you look at the lingual artery, it does not get into the base of the tongue. It goes quite lateral and then it converges and goes into the anterior two-third of the tongue. Only a branch of the lingual, uh, which is the dorsal lingual artery, that supplies the base of the tongue. And that's not really as big, though it can be troublesome at times. So if you look at the picture from the Gray's Anatomy, I put this picture every time because Gray's is, uh, you know, age old anatomy textbook. It shows that the lingual artery is at least one and a half to two centimeter away from the midline at the level of the foramen cecum and at least two centimeter below the surface. So that makes the tongue based surgery very, very safe. And you can confirm that by doing your own dissection. This is the cadaver dissection that we have performed. And you can see the lingual artery going right lateral at the level of the foramen cecum. You can see the lingual artery running absolute lateral and deep, leaving a lot of space on the top in the base tongue area to, you know, remove if the tongue base is cause of the trouble. So we understand the position and we can re even confirm the position of the lingual artery by performing a color Doppler before surgery if required. Though we hardly ever now do it if we are doing a small tongue base. Now how to approach tongue base? Though microscope can be a tool by which we can approach the tongue base, but generally it will, afford, uh, it will give us only a straight access and it's very difficult to get into the tongue base with a straight access unless it's a very small tongue base. So we prefer generally endoscopic guidance, either open or endoscopic. And robot is obviously a very, very great tool, though a very, very expensive tool to approach the base tongue. So the position typically we sit in uh, at the head end of the patient and the monitor is in front of us. The patient is in the river, uh, is in the Trendelenburg position around 15 degrees and we open the mouth of the patient. And this is the typical position that we operate the tongue base patient on. Though we have used 
every other position that is described by other researchers, but this is the position we found to be most suitable to perform tongue-based surgery. So keeping the patient head low by 15 degrees helps us to keep the saline flow into the uh, away from the larynx, uh, away from the operative area, the angle of the uh, plasma wand that we use, the saline flow is more accurate and it makes our life much easier if we keep the patient head low by 15 degrees, though the blood flow in the tongue is increased when you keep the patient head low, but overall your operative position is much easier if you keep the patient head low by 15 degrees. So we pull the tongue by push, uh, putting a suture in the middle of the tongue. It's not at the tip of the tongue. You have to pull out the base of the tongue. So the suture can be taken with 2 or silk in the middle of the tongue and you pull the tongue out. Then you apply a standard Boyle Davis mouth gag, though you can apply all the fancy mouth gags, but a standard uh, Boyle Davis mouth gag only criteria is that the tongue blade should be one size smaller. So if a routine palatal surgery, you are using number five. For tongue-based surgery, you'll be using number four. If the adult is a little smaller, then you'll be using number three uh, as against number four. So one size smaller tongue blade would be enough to expose the tongue base. And this is how you'll keep the tongue blade in uh, position. I generally recommend that uh, you do not uh, put it on the patient's chest. So you have a modified, you know, Mayo's trolley on which you can suspend. You should not put it on the patient's chest or even the Draffin bipods are not very stable. So this is a good arrangement that I have, uh, you know, come out with and this works very, very nice. This is attached onto the side table, uh, onto the side rails of the table. Then the endoscope we use is a 45 degree endoscope. We use 30 degrees, 70 degrees, but the best view we found was with the 45 degrees uh, endoscope. And generally a sinoscope is good enough. I'll show you the videos taken with a 45 degree sinoscope. Uh, and the videos are really excellent. Your visualization is good enough. You can always increase the uh, you know magnification by uh, increasing the magnification on the camera if you require. But generally, a 45 degree endoscope, sinoscope is good enough for you to perform a nice base tongue surgery. The tool that we use is coblation. Uh, now, almost exclusively, apart from the robot, I use coblation. I do not use radio frequency or cautery. Coblation is the best tool by which you can remove the tissues layer by layer. We use both uh, evac 70 extra hp wand as well as the precise max max has a great advantage that the electrodes are flat you can see it on the right side and the suction channel is large but i'll uh, you know it's very aggressive also so if you have to remove lymphoid tissues then evac 70 extra hp is very very good enough there's absolutely no need for a precise max but for a muscular based thing i believe precise max is a little better wand now the setting of the uh, plasma or the coblation is generally, I would recommend for the beginners to keep it at seven and three, only the standard tonsil setting because you are used to it. But as you progress, you can go up to this uh, settings of nine and five. And the saline flow really has to be generous because the uh, coblation works on the saline flow. If the saline flow is not good, then your plasma will not be uh, great. I'm not saying that your operative area should be flooded because if the area is flooded, then obviously the saline flow, the plasma will not be great. And your wand has to be bent by 30 to 45 degrees. Depending on the patient's anatomy, you bend your wand by 30 to 45 degrees. And this is how you bend the wand. So I'm just showing that the at the junction of the superior three-fourth and inferior one, sorry, distal one-fourth, the proximal three-fourth and distal one-fourth, you bend the wand, not by at an acute angle, but by a gradual bend. You do not make an acute bend, otherwise the suction channel will get blocked. So you bend the wand like this. You can use a wand bender tool or you can just use your thumb to bend it gently. But at the distal part, if you bend the wand in the middle part, it's not going to reach there. It has to be in the distal part. So now this is the most important slide, uh, slide on the use of irrigation. If the irrigation is too little, then your uh, wand will get clogged 
the path will not be complete if the irrigation is too much then saline will jet past the electrode again there will be a lot of if there is a pooling it will again cause electrical conductivity in your saline your uh, surgery will not be accurate if the suction is too little there will be pooling of saliva there will be clogging of horn and if the suction is too much then it can cause extinguishing of uh, plasma so you have to get an accurate balance of this by uh, of irrigation and suction and once you get used to doing say 100 adenoid surgery that's the time when you should uh, start doing your tongue based surgery oxygen so when you are operating putting in a small tube nasopharyngeal tube helps you the patient to get ventilated you can see that even at the base of 69 this patient is maintaining 100% saturation this is the most important part putting a small nasopharyngeal tube even in large tongue base makes your life much easier and using an angled uh, laryngoscope bypasses your tongue and you can intubate your patient very easily these are things discussed during the anesthesia consideration in the last talk so i'll not spend much time this slide is to show you the position please ignore my mask coming down my mouth because i am doing a live surgery here and explaining but this is how you can do and you can do layer by layer this uh, you can see this is a muscular based tongue and the epiglottis is deep down that's the epiglottis absolutely you know curled because of constant push and then you can this is a muscular tongue there's hardly any lymphoid tissue and you can see large muscular tongue the tongue has actually the tube is on the left side of the epiglottis it's no more in the middle line so do not get fooled by the tube and do not follow the tube thinking that it will always be in midline because then you'll straight up land up into the lingual artery so i will just uh, let this video go for a while and then fast forward so you layer by layer you remove tissues if required you can coagulate and then ablate but finally you will require to ablate tissues unless you ablate large amount of tissues in this kind of a muscular based tongue you will not get a good result so i'll gently fast forward so that you can keep seeing what i'm doing now you have to save yourself from eating up the epiglottis but if the epiglottis is actually the mucosa is actually keep keeps coming in your way then you coagulate the mucosa now we are coagulating the mucosa because on the lingual surface of the epiglottis only will not go till the uh, free margin of the epiglottis or will not go into the pharyngeal surface of the epiglottis will remain on the lingual surface of the epiglottis will keep removing tissues layer by layer and that's when you can remove a lot of tissues and as we have seen that most of the surgeries give between 5 to 10 millimeters of retrolingual space so by this surgery you can definitely achieve between 5 to 10 millimeter or even more than a, mil, uh, a centimeter 5 millimeter to 1 centimeter so you can achieve definitely more than 5 millimeter to 1 centimeter by this surgery and layer by layer layer by layer you keep making space and till we get the nerve stimulation in our country tongue based surgery still remains the workhorse for the sleep surgeons because though uh, nerve stimulation will offer a much less painful uh, you know option but uh, looking at the cost and the availability right now it's more than $25,000 uh, tongue based surgery still remains the workhorse so you start from the foramen cecum go up to the median glossy epiglottic ligament in the midline and up to the lateral glossy epiglottic ligament laterally so you can see the whole pharyngeal mucosa is so lax and you have to make sure that you are not uh, traumatizing the mucosa on the other parts because then there will be bad oropharyngeal stenosis which is will, will be very very difficult to treat so with all the patients you let this you know let this tissues come in your wand and then only you press on the wand and gradually gradually reduce the tissues ablation very very gently because you do not want you can see the space being opened up you do not want any bleeding in that area so very very gently you'll go remove tissues layer by layer millimeter by millimeter i'll just fast forward so that I'm just fast forwarding so that you can see what is happening but layer by layer layer by layer you remove tissues like a paint brush you use your coblation wand 
and keep on yeah that's the median glossopeglottic ligament so unless you reach the median glossopeglottic ligament have removed sufficient amount of tissue which like stuart said that you have to decide uh, depending on your polysomnography depending on your physical examination depending on depending on your dice you have to decide how much tissue has to be removed so once you have removed that adequate amount of tissue then you'll get a adequate result now that's the median glossopeglottic ligament and you can see that lower tongue based surgery you have to remove less amount of tissue and you'll get a much better result again i'm fast forwarding so generally going up to 1 cm in the tongue base is absolutely safe you have to re retain your midline and this is a small surgery actually the unedited video is also hardly 11 minutes so you can see that this surgery gets over in 10 to 15 minutes and you'll get a very very good result so that's the end point you have to remove tissues right from the foramen cecum to the middle uh, median glossopeglottic ligament and create a raw area for the epiglottis and the tongue to join again a video of another case showing that that's the median glossopeglottic ligament and you have to remove all the lymphoid tissues uh by ablation and you have to create a raw area you have to go into the muscles if required and then create a raw area at the junction of the tongue and the epiglottis and unless you do that your surgery is not going to be very effective see how much of lymphoid tissue is still there so you have to remove all the lymphoid tissues right there in the uh, furrow it's a very very deep area it's looking much easier with a 45 degrees but you have to be really careful if you get a bleeding over there if you have a tongue base like this which i showed you earlier a lymphoid tongue base then the intubation is going to be a real challenge extubation may not be so much but this patients are generally decompensated so you can see that even at the base of 85 this patient is totally you know uh, compromised so a tracheostomy is not a bad idea in these patients so do a tracheostomy and then perform the tongue base surgery you can see here all the lymphoid tissue no muscular tongue base only lymphoid tissues has been removed and you can see the median glossopeglottic ligament over there then coming to robotic tongue base surgery we started the robotic surgery program in india in 2012 and though uh, the setup is pretty impressive but it's a very very expensive tool it's approximately 2 million dollar which is approximately 15 crore in india as of now and uh, the cost per surgery is also very high so our numbers over the period of time have gone down in favor of coblation because we are performing now more of coblation surgery than the robot but in the cases like this when you see this is a purely lateral tongue base this is the lateral collapse of the tongue base right for such cases robot is a very very good idea where you can actually hold lateral collapse of the muscular tongue base so you can actually split the uh, muscles in the midline and then remove the muscles as much as you as you want to remove again you can cut through the muscles by using cautery you use cautery in the robot so obviously there's a lot of fibrosis and pain but you can do a much uh, accurate job using both the hands and you can remove a lot of tissues using the cautery uh, of the robot so you go deeper and deeper that's into the vallecula and you can cut through the muscles so for muscular tongue bases like this i believe robot is still a very good option for lymphoid tissue coblation is much much more than good enough for small muscular tongue base also coblation is a very good option but for large muscular tongue bases robot is a good option and then you can remove all the tissues very very nicely with full control and you can measure how much tissue you have removed i'll just fast forward this also so you can see without any trauma to the epiglottis you can remove the tongue base of the tongue then comes the minimally invasive procedures uh, the smile procedure was already there which was blind so we made it uh, we changed it to submucosal endoscopic lingual base lysis this 
patient we are doing under uh, with tracheostomy because of retrognathia the only option for this patient was a maxillomandibular advancement and here you will see i am starting from the foramen cecum a little ahead of that in fact because of gross retrognathia and we go inside the tongue tissues with coblation and we make a tunnel inside the tongue you can see it's a tunnel covered by the mucosa so it's a submucosal technique we go as much as inside as we want to you know we have to go inside and then we fill this tunnel the uh, bulk of this tongue is uh, has become less and then we fill this tunnel with tissue glue so that it heals very fast there's no chance of secondary infection and bleeding once you fill it with tissue glue and this is our own technique uh, called submucosal endoscopic lingual vase lysis or smell then the result of this technique is again very well you can see the whole base tongue is uh, intact uh, the surface area is intact so the pain is very less and we nav navigate the lingual vessels uh, again we did it in 2011 the first time so that that was the first time in the world that we navigated the lingual vessels and you can see the muscular uh, metal tip here and the vessels lingual vessels and not only that we also measured the distance of our starting point as 2.5 cm from the uh, surface of the tongue in the middle of the surgery at 1.49 and the end of the surgery at 1.17 so this is one surgery by which you can actually go more than 1 and 1.5 1.3 cm more than what you can achieve with any surgery or almost similar to what you can achieve with mma so going forward this is the surgery which has a potential to give results as good as mma just the last slide saying that when you are performing surgeries you have to have a good knowledge of anatomy and you have to know what this is a vein this is not the lingual artery this is the lingual vein huge vein so you can you have to know what can come how to control what can happen if there's a on table bleeding what happens when there's a secondary bleeding how will you control it and what is your backup and everything so before jumping into tongue based surgery i would suggest that look at this river of blood into the area where you know a catastrophe is waiting for you before you jump on to this please uh, no the slides have come by mistake so please take care please learn this uh, things nicely from the experts have an expert on your side before you jump on to doing this surgery and i wish you all the best along with stewart's tips that we have got i believe you'll do a good job coming forward thank you very much thank you very much vikas the visit was a brilliant presentation uh, as usual on uh, i think there are a lot more tips and tricks that we could learn from your talk as well um now i would invite uh, dr vidya sagar to deliver his talk on uh, epiglottis uh, in osc it's uh, uh, it's one of the most important causes for uh, cpap failure uh, dr vidya sagar please go ahead good morning uh, everyone welcome to this uh, iassa class 10 series at the outset i would like to thank iassa and sun pharma for their wonderful partnership in bringing out this wonderful class series session and i also like to thank strinivas for wonderful introduction and more importantly the two uh, best speakers who had uh, done a fabulous job in giving the tips of tongue based surgery and when and how to do the tongue based surgeries so my topic of the day is going to be management of the epiglottis in obstructive sleep apnea so what is this epiglottic collapse so before we um came across this wonderful dynamic assessment that is the drug induced sleep endoscopy or dynamic mr we were only evaluating the patient clinically and we were not even exposed to this concept of what is called as epiglottic collapse and when we first heard about this epiglottic collapse causing osa we were all little bit surprised to hear about it but then once we started doing dynamic mr as well as drug induced sleep endoscopy we found this kind of dynamic obstruction that is happening at the epiglottis and that was shutting the airway and it was causing a collapse so this is the uh, epiglottic collapse that i am going to talk about today so what is the prevalence of epiglottic collapse at least in india 
So if you had had this as this question way back in 2006, then I would have said, what? What is this epiglottic collapse? But then in 2010, as we were starting to do the dice, then our expression changed. Oh yeah, maybe it is there. Yes, we do see it. And then in 2013, if you had asked me the same question, we would have said, oh wow, it is common. And now if you say it, yes, definitely it is common. And guess what? We even know the types of epiglottic collapse and we would also see why it is happening, how it is happening. And we also have some amount of idea how to manage them. So if you go to the world's literature and see what is the incidence of this epiglottic collapse, it varies from either anywhere between 12% all the way to 42%. So this is an article which says that the epiglottic collapse has been implicated in 12% cases of OSA. And more importantly, if you see here, they have found that majority of the patients with the CPAP failure had a accentuated collapse at the level of epiglottis. This is the, another article by uh, Claudio et al, which says that the incidence of epiglottic collapse is approximately 38%. Coming to the types of epiglottic collapse, it can be of various types. It can be either a partial collapse or a complete collapse. And number two, it can be a secondary epiglottic collapse, wherein, as Vikash was mentioning, there could be a tongue-based tissue that was pushing the epiglottis and it is causing a collapse. We call it as a secondary epiglottic collapse. And the most important type is the primary epiglottic collapse, wherein the Epiglottis standalone collapses with the negative pressure. And again, this is again divided into two types. One is the trapdoor kind of epiglottic collapse. The other one is the curly type of epiglottic collapse like we see in the pediatric OSCs. So the most important questions we started to ask ourselves is, are we actually seeing this epiglottic collapse because of the excessive use of propofol. And that is when we started using this advanced dice, wherein we integrate the sleep study and then we insert this endoscope and we started to see the K complexes in the sleep study. And we saw that there was in fact a epiglottic collapse happening and that confirms that it happens in the natural sleep as well. This is a classical trapdoor epiglottis that is seen here. The next question we wanted to know is, is it a standalone epiglottic collapse or is it because of a reverse Bernoulli phenomenon that is happening? So to counter that, what we did, we inserted this nasopharyngeal airway. And once we inserted the nasopharyngeal airway, which bypasses the oropharyngeal collapse and to a certain extent, the lateral pharyngeal collapse. And then we started to see if this collapse persists or not. So if this persists, then indirectly it tells that it is definitely a primary epiglottic collapse, which needs to be addressed. And then we started to notice this kind of curly epiglottic collapse also, but in a regular dice, we started to notice that it is associated more with the lateral pharyngeal collapses like what you're seeing here. Again, to test whether it is a standalone or whether it is uh, 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 because of the lateral pharyngeal wall uh, collapse, what we did again, we used to do a interventional dice. And in interventional dice, if we find this curly epiglottis persisting in spite of our nasopharyngeal airway, we, we thought that it is a primary collapse. Then the next thing we, what we did is we changed the position. Like I'll show it again. We kind of tilt the patient's head and see if that collapse disappears or it persists. So here we notice that in spite of positional changes, we too tend to see that the epiglottic collapse persists and in fact, sometimes it even aggravates. So what we understand by this 
we understand unlike a tongue based collapse which accentuates in the supine position and reduces in the lateral position it the epiglottic collapse does not uh, go away with the positional change the next important type of collapse that i wanted to show is this secondary epiglottic collapse that is you have a bulky tongue base like what is shown here and this tongue base is actually pushing the epiglottis and causing the tongue base obstruction so in these instances you are not supposed to directly address the epiglottis in fact if you address the tongue base as dr vikas has shown then it would be uh, more than uh, enough to address the epiglottic collapse as well so in nutshell what is the management we all notice that this epiglottic collapse have been seen more in the cpap failures so what it tells your cpap is not going to help these kind of epiglottic collapse so the reason is if you give a cpap it is going to push the epiglottis further down and if in case the patient is having a trapped door type of epiglottis then it is going to aggravate the problem further and the patient may not tolerate it so majority of the time your patients are going to be uh, failing the cpap if you are going to uh, give the cpap for a epiglottic collapse so this comes to the uh, bottom line that surgery may play a major role in this kind of collapses or in other words surgery is much more rewarding in addressing this epiglottic collapse this surgery can be of two types one is an external procedure like uh, in combination with the higher advancement you can do a procedure or you can do a internal procedure the best would be obviously to do a kind of a pexy or a plasty but then we also have other procedures as well so let's assume if it is a secondary epiglottic collapse like you see here this is a tongue base mass that is pushing the epiglottis all you need to do is you need to you excise the lesion you just excise the lesion and you would see in the post operative phase how beautifully the epiglottic collapse has been relieved off so the take home message number 1 is if there is a static obstruction causing a secondary epiglottic collapse you address that static obstruction most likely the epiglottic collapse will improve on the contrary if you have a primary epiglottic collapse like how i had shown and if in case this primary epiglottic collapse persist in spite of your in interventional dice then you have the option of doing either a epiglottoplasty or a epiglottoplexy or you can also do this procedure what is called as suprahyoid epiglottectomy the suprahyoid epiglottectomy is a procedure therein we resect the suprahyoid portion of the epiglottis how do we know approximately the suprahyoid epiglottis we kind of take the lateral glosso epiglottic ligament on either side and we try to resect the portion of the epiglottis that is above the lateral glosso epiglottic ligament so as you know in the anatomy lecture by dipanka he has said that you get lot of lingual vessels and the branches of the lingual artery from the lateral glosso epiglottic ligament area it is always prudent to bipolarize or have a good vascular control of that lateral glosso epiglottic ligament and then you can use any of your tool like a scissor or a coblator or a laryngeal scissor here in i am using a pediatric laparoscopic scissors the reason i am using it is it can be tilted and rotated in whatever direction we want thereby we can resect the suprahyoid portion of the uh, epiglottis here i am keeping the patient in the rose position with the same technique like what vikas has shown and i am using a 45 degree endoscope and my assistant is using the 45 degree endoscope to show it wherein i am using a alice forceps to hold the epiglottis in one hand and with the other hand i am using the pediatric laparoscopic scissors and trying to resect the bipolarized suprahyoid 
portion of the epiglottis like what I have shown before. Alternatively, I keep bipolarizing the mucosa as well as the attachment of the suprahyoid epiglottis. And then I use the pediatric laparoscopic scissors to resect the bipolarized area. The most important thing is you have to be above the lateral glossoepiglottic ligament, which is the suprahyoid epiglottis. You can use your cobblator to uh, uh, surface ablate the mucosa as well. I'll try to show it in a pediatric case subsequently. But here we are using the bipolar. You can also use a harmonic scalpel. I think Dr. D. Vidya Saka and Dr. Srinivas Kishore has a beautiful case that uh, they have demonstrated elsewhere before. So here we have resected it. The first and foremost question you would want to know is whether how is the healing is. So we are doing a flexible endoscopy in the post one month postoperative to see how the epiglottis heals in the postoperative period. So here we can see that it has healed in beautifully. But the next question you would ask is, will the patient have aspiration? To test whether the patient is having aspiration or not, we are kind of doing a feast test by giving a clear liquids here. You can see that we have given water and we can see that there is no penetration or aspiration even when doing a feast test. And the reason is we have the three tire mechanism wherein you have the two vocal cords, false vocal cord, and the infrahyoid epiglottis that is going to help in preventing the aspiration. Coming to the problems, what they can have, one is pain. Because the pain sensation is less in the uh, uh, epiglottis when compared to the pharyngeal mucosa or to the palate, these patients do not complain that much of pain in the postoperative phase. They do have a temporary dysphagia for maybe a week or two, but then after two weeks, they are usually pretty normal. Uh, as I had said, uh, none of my patients had any aspiration. There was a patient, one patient who had a temporary, uh, complaining of temporary change of test, but that was in a patient where we did a, uh, we did a glossoepiglottopexy uh, following a secondary epiglottic collapse. So this is a patient, actually a pediatric child who was having a severe pediatric OSA uh, because of the laryngeal OSA, because of the severe laryngomalacia. The reason I'm showing this video is we can also use the coblator to ablate the mucosa over the epiglottis. Here I'm just doing a epiglottopexy with the coblator first, but the point that I wanted to show is this. So if you want to do a, a epiglottectomy, you can also do this suprahyoid epiglottectomy. You can ablate the surface of the laryngeal mucosa with the coblator also like this and you have to make sure that you are above the lateral glossoepiglottic ligament like what I had shown you before and then you can use your simple laryngeal scissors and you can pretty much excise only the suprahyoid portion of the epiglottis like what I have shown here. So this would be very beneficial in addressing your uh, epiglottic collapse. The other technique of addressing the epiglottic collapse is by doing a glossoepiglossopexy, wherein you can do an external procedure like a hyoid advancement, wherein as soon as you open the neck and once you identify the thyrohyoid ligament uh, membrane, you can pass a suture through and through, uh, I'll try to show you in the video. This is a hyoid advancement video. I think uh, Dr. Srinivas has wonderfully demonstrated how a hyoid advancement is done. Uh, but the reason I'm showing this video is to show where I would pass the suture. See, once you skeletonize the hyoid and the thyroid cartilage, the next step what you can do is, you can pass a suture from the thyroid cartilage and then take it in between the hyoid and thyroid cartilage to the thyrohyoid ligament and hug the epiglottis. What is the structure that is going to be there? Petiole of the epiglottis. So you can take a suture 
into the uh, uh, petiole of the epiglottis and take a bite and come out of the hyoid bone and then it will kind of pull the epiglottis towards the hyoid it will kind of do a um, epiglottopexy so that is what we we are trying to do it in the hyoid advancement and if you do this this is what you will achieve so you can pull open the epiglottis and you have a tie, uh, tie here that will keep the uh, epiglottis uh, tethered here and thereby it will open up the airway so as uh, dr vikas has already shown about the uh, secondary epiglottic collapse caused by the tongue base i'll just show that uh, when you are doing this tongue base surgery you can also ablate the mucosa over the epiglottic surface that is the valicular surface of the epiglottis and then you create a raw surface there thereby you create a fibrous scarring you create a fibrous scarring between the tongue base and the valicular surface of the epiglottis so this creates a kind of a glosso epiglottopexy so this you can see that there is a raw surface in the epiglottis and there is a raw surface in the tongue base so this creates a glosso epiglottopexy and this also kind of stiffens the epiglottis and thereby addresses the secondary epiglottic collapse so these are the various techniques of doing a uh, uh, managing a epiglottic collapse both the primary and secondary but as dr dr vikas was saying until we get the uh, hypoglossal implant uh, we will not be able to address the primary epiglottic collapse uh, in its inherent way so the results coming to the results we had uh, gotten involved with five cases of primary epiglottic collapse and 14 cases of secondary epiglottic collapse and six cases of pediatric supraglottoplasty and the subjective success is tremendous you get at least 90 to 95% of subjective success and uh, approximately 86% objective improvement provided it is an isolated uh, epiglottic collapse to conclude hypopharyngeal collapse plays a big role in osa epiglottic collapse contributes significantly in that identification is key by either a drug induced sleep endoscopy or dynamic mr and most important thing is uh, cpap may not play an effective role and hence a surgery should be tailor made according to the type of collapse and according to the severity of the collapse as mentioned before many of the times if it is associated a secondary epiglottic collapse a primary procedure addressing the palate or the tongue base may be more than enough to address the epiglottic collapse with the permission of the chair as we are uh, starting the seeing the patients following the covid this is i just want to take one minute time to see uh, show how we have modified our opd uh, here we have uh, put a curtain made of pvc um the patient will be there is a complete interface between the patient as well as the ent surgeons there is a, a, a technician or a staff member with the ppe with the patient side we have created a glove that goes in through this pvc and uh, through this uh, we can even do a, a ent examination we can do a examination of the oral cavity oropharynx we can uh, do a examination of uh, Uh, the nasal cavity as well and we can do a good uh, ent exam we do a, a, a temporary cleaning with the hypochlorite and at the end of the procedure the patient goes off we clean this entire pvc with a hypochlorite spray so this is how we are doing our examination in the uh, opd uh, uh, in spite of having this interface it is always prudent to have a uh, protective measures like n95 mask as well as the goggle and for doing an endoscopy we came up with this mask wherein we we make a small uh, slit in in the glove or we can use this kind of a uh, uh, shell that we have created and we have um, created this kind of a chamber 
wherein the endoscopic equipment as well as the entire uh, room is separated and the surgeon wears a full blown ppe with the uh, visor and we are using this mask with the slit in through which we are passing this flexible scope and we are able to do a endoscopy and there is an assistant who is with the ppe i know that this may have some defects but this is the best what we are doing as of now we are trying to improvise as much as possible and uh, thank you for your time uh, once again thank you thank you dr vidya sagar for that excellent talk on uh, epiglottis i think you have covered all the aspects of it and thank you for those covid tips towards the end i think that would be broad beneficial for a lot of people um so i have questions um so uh, i will start with uh, vikas yeah um, are you able to hear my voice yes yes loud and clear so uh, dr kutecha uh, from london he congratulates you on your uh, wonderful presentation uh, his question is uh some regeneration of uh, tongue based tissue is not uncommon be it after laser or coblation do you see that in your patients so dr b kutecha is our senior and uh, you know he is an expert that we all have learned from and uh, this is true that some regeneration is there but uh, generally in my practice it's only 10 years that i'm practicing your practice is much more sir it's not has been it has not been enough to produce symptoms again or collapse again and so when we do the surgery if it is lymphoid tissue and you have removed all the lymphoid tissue till the muscular layer then i have not seen any regeneration of the lymphoid tissue again if it is the muscular tissue then it's very difficult to assess how much i had removed and what has regenerated but generally in that case it has not been enough to for us to go in again and perform a surgery again or for the patient to have a collapse of the tongue base again to require a surgery so the answer to your question is that little amount of regeneration of muscular tissue is expected but that would uh, generally in my experience would not require a revision surgery and you can actually little overdo in the tongue in the palate you cannot overdo in the tongue you can overdo rather than underdo Right. So the next question is from uh, Dr. Sanjeev from uh, Nagpur. He's a uh, uh, no. I think that is for uh, Sagar. For you, I think uh, Dr. Eva has asked you a question, uh, Vikas. Yeah. Uh, she says, could you share your post-operative treatment protocol, especially analgesia post-op, and uh, for patients who have undergone base tongue surgery by coagulation? when do you usually discharge the patient and if no complications after tongue base uh, surgery correct so yeah so dr eva uh, i am very happy that you have been listening to all the all the talks uh, in detail so see as i mentioned in my other talk that the pain in oral cavity surgery is because of two reasons one is because of the loss of mucosa when there is a mucosal ulcer so that pain you can easily take care of by providing surface anesthesia uh, that means lidocam gargles or lidocam tablets for sucking pain is easily taken care of so when you only perform a, a lingual tonsillectomy the patient will not have pain once you give him lidocam tablets to suck or lidocam gargles to do in fact tablets to suck is a better option because that area gargles do not reach the moment you get into the muscles when you are performing muscles any surgery on the muscles muscles either get inflamed or they get caught into sutures so in tongue based surgery obviously you are not suturing so it's only the inflammation of muscles muscles when they contract and they are inflamed uh, they are going to hurt so if you give good amount of anti inflammatory then the muscle inflammation is taken care of and with coblation the inflammation is anyway much lesser so the pain with uh, coblation is much less than that i get with cautery which i use in the robot that is one reason if it is a small tongue base i would prefer coblation so that the pain is much less now the second part of your question so uh, anti inflammatory is good enough second part of the question when do i discharge the patient so if it is a small tongue base 
a small muscular tongue base i extubate the patient on table and this patient can stay overnight and go home the next morning because generally palate and tongue base are done in a single stage at my center nose is not done at the same stage so when we extubate the patient if it is large tongue base we extubate the patient next morning then he stays for one more day and goes away otherwise in the routine case they we extubate the patient on table and he goes home the next morning so extubation uh, 24 hours after extubation the uh, tongue base patient goes home if it is only lingual tonsil then the patient goes home by the evening itself he does not need to stay in the hospital if it is a small lingual tonsil he does not need to stay in the hospital if it is a large lingual tonsil then obviously we'll make him stay overnight right so uh, the next question uh, i think is uh, we can go to uh, vidya sagar so Okay, this is uh, Dr. Sanjeev. Uh, Dr. Sanjeev Golhar from Nagpur. What precautions do you take when you use uh, cautery when you are operating on the epiglottis? Yeah, good question, uh, Dr. Sanjeev. So uh, uh, we use preferably a bipolar. So that is the first, first and foremost thing that I wanted to say. So if in case you are using a monopolar, you have to make sure that you use a cheek retractor. so i think uh, strinivas has shown one beautiful case uh, in his previous presentation how he uses the cheek retractor so we also use the cheek retractor so that your cheek or the lateral uh, oral commissures does not get any thermal back, uh, burns the next thing is you have to see where the tip is see because you you will be always looking at the monitor you will not be looking at the entire tool where it is in contact to in case you are using a monopolar you have to make sure that the monopolar tip and the hand piece gets attached properly and there is no space between and that is the space between that area if it comes into contact with the mucosa that is where you get a lot of thermal band burns so you need to take a precaution you need to see the contact points and then only you have to start doing the surgery and the third thing is if you are preferably using the bipolar the loop gets completed in the point where you are applying the bipolar so most often you uh, the the current does not cause any thermal damage to the other other structures but in terms of cautery uh, settings i generally try to use the bipolar in the setting of 12 to 15 that is the setting that i go for so does it kind of answer uh, strenuous Yeah, I think I hope he understands it. Okay. <laughs> For I, me, it understands. Yeah, I I just wanted to add one thing that whenever you are using any thermal device, uh, do not make a circumferential raw area because it will contract very badly and you will get stenosis. So this is one thing uh, more true for cautery because it causes three fifty to four hundred degree centigrade. But even with anything, if you create a circumferential raw area. that's a disaster in waiting that's going to go for a scar so sagar the next question for you is uh, dr yogesh singhal from uh, modi nagar yeah. he says um how long okay uh, how long both of you can take this uh, answer but first uh, question i will ask you sagar yeah his question is in case we go beyond the lateral glossa epiglottic ligament what will happen So I think his question is impertinent to the epiglottis Correct. section. Yes. So if in case you go beyond the lateral glossal epiglottic ligament, the chance of aspiration is more because you are going to resect a lot more of the epiglottis. So in the three-tier mechanism, the infrahyoid, the vocal cord is functioning all right. The false vocal cord is also functioning all right, but your infrahyoid epiglottis that is kind of preventing any entry of the uh, food into the airway gets disturbed so there is a likelihood that the patient may have aspirations yeah and also you would enter the pre epiglottic space which you obviously don't you want don't to want expose to. and the second thing is as you go down below the blood vessels the profunda blood supply comes more and you may also get lot more bleeding than what you would get it in the supra aortic epiglottis okay so uh, the next question again uh, vikas is by dr yogesh uh, he says if you were to do a, a tracheostomy 
for your tongue base how long will you keep the tube for so generally i would do tracheostomy in two three conditions if the tongue base is really large muscular uh, if the patient cannot tolerate uh, you know if the gag is very high and in uh, deformities so the minimum time that i expect the healing to happen a secondary bleeding to happen is say around 2 weeks so i will safely keep the tracheostomy for 10 to 14 days so that the chances of a secondary bleeding and the healing inside the oral cavity is complete so that there will be no bleeding further on so i would generally if i have done a tracheostomy i'll keep it for some period between 10 to 14 weeks and obviously you can let the patient speak you can put a tracheostomy tube with a inner and outer tube with a speaking valve so that's what i generally put it cost around 7 to 8000 bucks but it's worth doing that because then you can take out the inner tube clean it and put it back and the patient can actually go home with this the tracheostomy tube that's the answer to the question um this is for you sirs from uh, dr kotecha he yes, congratulates you on his brilliant on your brilliant presentation and uh, also he appreciates your uh, the tips that you've given at the end of your presentation in the covid era his question is with an adult type of laryngomalacia i use a laser to scar the lingual surface of the epiglottis in a linear manner leaving an island of normal mucosa in patients with uh, in curling of the epiglottis but results with this are not as good as a large wedge resection which is more radical your views and um, thank you for this wonderful question you, and uh, do you did you understand it do you want yes, me to go yes, through yes. that again no 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 i got it i got it so thank you dr kotecha for uh, being with us and uh, following our webinars and uh, thanks for your compliments as well yes so in a pediatric laryngomalacias there is a procedure wherein we used to use the laser in a striations like a vertical striations with the mucosal gap in between what it does is it kind of opens the curly epiglottis like this if you see in the post operative period it opens up like this if you want i have a video to show you also but for the want of time it's up to you moderator but when it comes to the adult if you just to do that it is not sufficient because of the memory of the epiglottic uh, cartilage the in the pediatric uh, population the epiglottis is almost adherent to the mucosa and when you are using the laser your energy also goes to the epiglottic cartilage and it kind of causes a scarring which kind of bends open the epiglottis in a open fashion but in adult it has almost gone in for a memory wherein your wedge uh, or a striation alone is not adequate to cause that much of opening so for that reason it is always better to do a little bit of resection rather than just causing a linear striations so i totally agree with this point yes even in our uh, patients uh, in adult type of curly type of uh, epiglottis we try to resect the part of the epiglottis rather than just causing uh, vertical striations thank you sir thanks for the question thank you because uh, we are running out of time so yes. last question from uh, dr eva Uh, her question to you is do you prescribe steroids for your patient after tongue base cublation no it's just one shot of steroid given during the surgery uh, after that we do not give any steroid because we want the wound to heal fast if we give steroid in the post operative period it will delay the healing process and we want the wound to heal fast so that the chances of secondary bleeding is lesser secondary infection is also increased if you give more steroids but more the healing process we want more more fibrosis to happen in the uh, you know tongue base therefore we do not give any post operative steroid only one shot during the surgery is given which is for immediately po immediate post operatively there should not be any edema and also because i think cublation is much gentler than right. radio monopolar or bovi which Correct. can cause very severe uh, post operative edema and i forgot to mention that point which i have already uh, i always mention is that the edema of the post operative in the tongue is because of the length of the tongue blade that you apply if you apply the tongue blade blade for more than 15 20 minutes in a row then the venous supply of the tongue is uh, compromised that leads to you know accumulation of uh, 
the chemicals and that leads to uh, inflammation of the tongue if you do not uh, let the tongue be strapped for more than 15 20 minutes if you remove the tongue blade and reapply after 15 minutes then possibly the edema will not happen especially with coagulation there will be no edema so i think uh, uh, dear colleagues we have come to the uh, end of uh, today's webinar thank you very much uh, uh, stuart stuart is not there but we can definitely convey uh, our sincere thanks to him for sparing his time for our uh, web series thank you vikas again for a wonderful talk sagar for your uh, uh, excellent deliberations on uh, epiglottis and your uh, covid tips uh, the innovative thank you uh, thank you shrinivas and I would uh, like to pass on the uh, mic to uh, Mr. Ambish. Thank you, students. Hey, yes, one minute. Uh, uh, unmute. Yeah, yeah, I'll be taking care, but I mean, my video is to stop. I mean, I mean it's muted. It's muted. Okay, anyhow, no problem. I can. Uh, yeah, Mr. Yeah, no Scott. problem. This is, yeah, this is Mahindra Verman. Yes, we can't see you, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah now we yeah. can see you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, good afternoon once again to all of you. And this is Mahindra Verman, interested responsible. Oh, muted again. We muted, uh, you're muted again. So you'll have to say it again, uh, uh, Mr. Verman. Can you, can you hear me? Now yes. we can. Yeah. Yeah, this is the Mahindra Verman, interested the responsibility of uh, what up, uh, rendering vote of thanks today on behalf of San Pharma. Today's webinar is a milestone, I would say, as this is the 10th webinar as a series in the field of OSA. And this achievement has not happened just like that. And this, the extraordinary efforts and dedication and the significant contribution from the team of IASSA under the guidance of Dr. Naveen Patel, Dr. Vijay Krishnan, Dr. Srinivas Kishore, Dr. Vikka Sakarwal, Dr. Simap Shik, Dr. Vitya Sagar, Deepak Debankar, and Dr. Anjani has made it possible. And I would say that when these words are not enough to render my sincere thanks to that. Team IASSA could uh, get uh, many reputed international speakers to this platform. And uh, sincere big thanks to the team IASSA for this wonderful efforts. And awful thanks to Dr. Stewart today uh, and Dr. Vikas, the speakers of today, and also the moderator, Dr. Srinivas Kishore. Thanks to all the participants who really encouraged San Pharma and ISA to organize such interesting uh, webinars. And my sincere thanks to all of you once again. And we will continue this uh, our service to the society of ISA. So, so if you are done, uh, Mr. Vanman, I have quick two announcements to make. Uh, yeah, with please, your permission? Yeah, sir. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. So, um, Sun Pharma has been very kind enough to sort of allow us to uh, have two more wonderful such webinars because uh, looking at the kind of response we've been getting and uh, so, uh, so we have two more uh, webinars. Uh, each of the webinars are truly of international scale. Uh, so, since most of us have started practice, we have uh, shifted the time as well as the day. The days are now going to be on Saturday, which is going to be a weekend. And uh, the next two webinars are going to be on the dates of 23rd and 30th of May. And please note the time. It's going to be between 5 and 7 p.m. This is to respect the, uh, the international speakers that are going to come in from America and Europe. Uh, keeping their time in, uh, in perspective, uh, we have taken this, uh, this decision. The next two this, uh, talks are also going to be, uh, webinars are also going to be uh, of very high standards in terms of academic and uh, technique well value. Uh, thank you, Sun Pharma, again for giving us this, these two extra uh, webinars. And um, thank you, Dr. Uh, Naveen Patel, for making this happen and taking this initiative for uh, bridging this between IASSA and Sun Pharma. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think it's a team effort of uh, each one of us. Thank you. Thank you.